Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, an administrative announcement. Um, I have first problem set here for you to pick up. Um, you can pick it up on your way out of class. It will be due uh, next Wednesday at the beginning of class. Um, uh, the TA situation has only now just been sorted out. There was some shuffling of TAs between classes. Um, but we now have uh, uh, set TAs for the class. Um, and I will be setting up some TA office hours uh, for you to go and ask them questions. Um, do you guys have a preferred day or time for office hours? I was thinking Monday afternoon. Is that reasonable? No. Thursday? Okay. The one thing is that uh, problem sets are due Wednesdays, and so I was thinking having something not the day before uh, the problem sets due, because then everyone will just go and try and get the TA to do the problem set, but maybe like Monday. Is Monday okay? People don't like Monday, though? When, did you, when do you have live Monday? You must have it at a time. What time? What hours? After two. After two. Okay, what if we just... Two to four is when you have lab. Okay, what if we add office hours at four on... Uh, two to four works. Okay, why don't I see... Why don't I see if we can schedule the TA office hours between 2 and 4 p.m. on Monday, if that seems to work for most people. Can we put, like, after class Oh, okay. What about um, Monday morning? <laughs> Why no? You have class. All morning Monday? Everyone has classes. We could do it Tuesday. Is Tuesday better? Okay. We could also do it Thursday, but... Uh, let's do Tuesday. Tuesday. Let's do Tuesday in the morning. What about 11 a.m. on Tuesday? Is that everyone busy at 11 a.m. on Tuesday? Okay. How about 2 p.m. on Tuesday? 2 p.m. on Tuesday. It'll have to be more like actually no. It'll have to be more like 2:30 or 3 p.m. on Tuesday. Is that okay? Can I get a little quiet? Can I get some quiet, please? Quiet, please. Thank you. So uh, provisionally, let's say that the TA's office hours will be sometime on Tuesday afternoon, probably 2 or 3 or something like that. I'll need to check with them to see what their availability is. Um, okay. Um, and the other announcement, as I said, is that there's a problem set for you to pick up, which is due next week. Um, any other announcements of an administrative nature? Any questions that people have? We should probably talk about scheduling the midterm at some point. Um, let's not do it today, let's do it next class, because I'll need to check my schedule and my anticipated course uh, curriculum to see that it's at an appropriate time. It'll probably be in mid-October at some point. Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I, all of you choose one cell in modern Texas, so I have 10 to 15 copies going for $60 if anybody wants to get one of those instead of paying postal prices. My email's just on the board. If you guys want to send me an email, I can have you guys go outside. Do, do I get a 10% cut because you made the announcement <laughs> during my class? <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, good. Um, okay, enough administrative stuff. Let's do some physics. So we spent the last week or so uh, understanding uh, various uh, very general uh, features of the quantum and relativistic corrections to classical physics. We learned how to estimate the sizes of these effects uh, in various sorts of circumstances. But now it's time to uh, roll up our sleeves and start learning uh, some of the details of these theories. And the theory which is going to occupy our time for the next three to four weeks or so is going to be the theory of special relativity. And so what I would like to do this class, and uh, probably most of next class, is outline uh, some of the most basic features of special relativity, the basic postulates underlying relativity, and the three basic consequences of special relativity, namely the relativity of simultaneity, time dilation, and length contraction, before in the following weeks outlining some of the more um, advanced aspects of special relativity, uh, Lorentz transformations, the structure of space-time, relativistic kinematics, and so forth. So just as a help to me, uh, 
When I say time dilation and length contraction, how many people are familiar with those terms and would know more or less exactly uh, what is meant by them? Okay, so the vast majority of you. So that means that I can go uh, a bit quickly today. Um, it's going to be a bit of a review for most of you. Um, before next class, diving into more details of Lorentz transformations and so forth, just to help me orient myself, how many of you, uh, for example, know the formula for a Lorentz transformation? Okay, that helps me... Uh, Raise your hands high, though, so I can see. Okay, so maybe a third of you. That helps me calibrate. Um, okay, so for those of you uh, who have seen Lorentz transformations before, um, the next week or so might be a bit of a review, um, but that's okay. Uh, special relativity is a complicated enough subject that you uh, will see it many times in your physics career, um, and that's a good thing because it's a little hard to wrap your head around. And so even though today is not the first time you will have seen special relativity, it will most likely not be the last. And I think you'll discover that throughout your physics career, uh, you'll revisit the subject um, at various times at varying different uh, levels of precision and uh, levels of abstraction. Okay. So um, before talking about um, special relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity, I would just like to start by discussing... Um, relativity in pre-Einstein physics, namely relativity in uh, the physics of Newton and Galileo. And the basic principle, which I believe was first um, stated by Galileo, is that only relative motion of objects is measurable. Or, to state that a bit more precisely, if we imagine that we have some sort of physics experiment, so a physics experiment which is carried out in a laboratory at rest will give the same result as the identical physics experiment carried out in a laboratory uh, which is in motion. And it has to be in motion at constant velocity relative to the one at rest. Now, of course, a uh, experiment carried out in a laboratory which is accelerating or rotating in some way would give different sorts of results because of, for example, centrifugal or centripetal forces. But the principle of relativity states that if the only relative motion is a constant velocity without any acceleration, then the outcome of any physics experiments should be the same. And in Newtonian physics, this is a true statement. And it is known as uh, Galilean relativity. So um, just to give you a bit of an example of Galilean relativity uh, in action, uh, let's consider uh, the following physics experiment. Okay. So let's say that I'm standing on a skateboard. Um, this is a thought experiment, by the way. I, I, don't, I don't do skateboards. Um, and let's say that I'm holding a baseball. OK, I also don't do baseballs. Um, and I throw this ball. OK. And so before the experiment, I'm standing here at rest holding the baseball. After the experiment, I'm moving to the left with some velocity, and the baseball is moving to the right with some velocity. And I could try, let's try and describe this uh, experiment in a bit more detail. So let's say that um, my initial velocity before the experiment would be zero, and that my final velocity after the experiment would be, let's say, so that of course will depend 
on uh, how quickly, uh, how hard I throw the baseball. So let's say I'm moving at half a meter per second just to have a number to throw around. Um, and so if I have a weight of just a round number for the sake of argument, 80 kilograms, um, and uh, the ball has a weight of two kilograms, then you could go ahead and use this to compute the velocity of the ball. Uh, one could do this using the conservation of momentum. So for example, with this velocity, so sorry, I should say Vx. So here, the subscript I refers to initial and the subscript F refers to final. So after I throw the baseball. So my final momentum would be uh, 40 minus 40 kilogram meters per second. And using the conservation of momentum, I could then derive the final velocity of the ball, which would be 20 meters per second. Okay. And you can check that 20 meters per second times the mass of the baseball, two kilograms, that's actually a pretty heavy baseball, now that I think about it. Uh, indeed, does give you 40 kilogram meters per second squared. Okay, it's a medicine ball or, or a yoga ball or something like that. One of those big Pilates balls. Okay. Um, okay, and so then I could, for example, um, compute the relative velocity after uh, the I throw the ball, which of course would be 20.5 meters per second. And I could compute the amount of work that is done by me as I throw the ball. And that would be computed by comparing, for example, the initial energy, which is zero because everything is at rest, to the final energy. The final energy is, of course, my kinetic energy, which is one half my mass times my velocity squared, plus that of the Pilates ball, which is uh, the mat one half its mass times its velocity squared, giving me a total of uh, 410 joules of work. Okay. So um, let's now consider this same experiment done uh, in a different laboratory. So let's say that I'm on a train and this train is uh, moving. And just for the sake of argument, let's say that this train is moving with a constant velocity of 20 meters per second to the left. So here I am on my hypothetical skateboard with my hypothetical baseball. Uh, and you are standing there watching this experiment from outside uh, and measuring, for example, my velocity, my momentum, and the amount of work that I'm doing as I throw this baseball. So again, now I can look at my initial velocity. So the initial velocity of both me and the baseball, from your point of view, watching me on this train is going to be minus 20 meters per second. My final velocity is going to be minus 20.5 meters per second. And the final velocity of the ball is going to be zero, right? Because I've thrown it 20 meters per second with a velocity of 20 meters per second to the right. And so it exactly cancels the 20 meters per second of the train. So from your point of view, my velocity and the velocity of the ball uh, is quite different from that, from the velocities that I will see uh, from the point of view of my, of the, of, uh, well, from the point of view of the train. Um, so for example, from my point of view standing on the train, um, I will be at rest and the ball will be moving with a velocity of 20 meters per second to the right. But from your point of view, where you see that I'm actually in a train that's moving, the ball will be at rest. But nevertheless, any, uh, all of the relative velocities and any physical quantities will be independent of which frame you use to do the calculation. So for example, I just above calculated the relative velocity and the amount of work done during this experiment. And you likewise could compute the uh, relative velocity of me and the ball, which again you would see is 20.5 meters per second, and you would get the same answer as I would. And likewise, for example, you could compute the amount of energy 
or the amount of work which is expended uh, during uh, this process. So how would you do that? Well, the initial energy is one half mv squared, so it would be one half times the total mass of me plus the ball, so that would be 82 kilograms times 20 squared, whereas e final would be one half my mass, which is 80, times my velocity, which would be 20.5 squared, uh, plus zero for the energy of the baseball, because from your point of view, the baseball is at rest. And so this initial energy now, if I did the calculation correctly, is 16,400 joules, whereas this is 16,810 joules. And so although from your point of view, my initial energy and my final energy are quite different from how they are from my point of view, the actual amount of work done, which is to say the difference in energies between uh, before and after this event, is the same. And so um, this is a very simple example of the principle of Galilean relativity in action, which um, should hopefully emphasize to you the lesson that the absolute values of, for example, velocity, energy, position, and so forth will differ between frames i.e. they will differ between observers but the outcome of experiments will not. So, for example, the relative velocity, the, work, the amount of work done during this experiment, or indeed any absolute facts about this experiment, such as the... Um, you know, uh, whether or not I throw the ball hard enough to hit the other side of the train or not. That's some fact. And that should be independent of whichever observer is describing this motion. I should make one comment here, which is that I've used the word reference frame here to describe the uh, measurements as uh, made by a given observer. And a uh, reference frame here is just, at this point, a fancy set of words that I use to say that I am measuring the events with respect to one observer as opposed to another. So, for example, I could talk about my reference frame where I'm sitting on the train and where I'm at rest and the ball is at rest initially. Or I could talk about your reference frame where you see the train moving at 20 meters per second and with respect to which I'm moving initially at 20 meters per second. And uh, so this was uh, a, a, a very simple example, but um, I think it's an extremely important one to think about because uh, it really emphasizes the fact that we need Galilean relativity to do physics. So um, Let's imagine a world where the principle of Galilean relativity is not true. And one would need to know the absolute velocity that I have in order to make, to determine the outcome of a sum experiment. Well, if you start thinking about such a world, you get very confused as to how we're supposed to do physics. So for example, the Earth is spinning. And our velocity uh, on the surface of the Earth due to uh, its rotation is something like 460 meters per second. And likewise, the Earth is orbiting around the sun. And its velocity 
due to its motion around the sun is something like 30 kilometers per second. And the sun itself and the earth likewise is moving through the universe at a velocity which is a little harder uh, to pin down absolutely because it's a difficult measurement, but it's something of an order of magnitude larger than that, something like 200 kilometers per second. So if you needed to know my absolute velocity rather than just my relative velocity in order to determine what happened when I throw a ball if I'm standing on a skateboard, then you would be in a lot of trouble because you would need to first understand the rotation of the Earth and then understand how the Earth goes around the sun and then understand how our solar system is moving through the universe, all in order to figure out how much work is done when I throw a tennis ball when I'm standing on a skateboard. And so, without Galilean relativity, I hope I'm spelling Galileo right. Okay, let's pretend that I am. We would need to account to all, we would need to account for all of this to do basic physics. And, there is a great deal of experimental evidence for Galilean relativity because we should believe we shouldn't believe a theory just because it makes our life easier. We should believe a theory if it's confirmed by experiment. And there are many, many experiments, uh, not just ones involving me on a skateboard on a train, which confirm Galilean relativity. So what sort of experiment could we imagine doing that would confirm Galilean relativity? Well, let me describe to you a particular experiment. And I've chosen this experiment carefully because we're going to come back and think about it later on in this class, and certainly next class. Let's consider the following experiment. Let's build two clocks. And let's say, for example, that these clocks work differently. Say one of them is a pendulum and the other is based on, is a water clock, where one tick, it come, where one of the clock ticks each time uh, a pendulum swings across the vertical and the other clock ticks each time a drop of water uh, falls through uh, the pen, falls through the clock. And let's synchronize them. So that one tick for clock number one takes the same amount of time as one click tick for clock number two. And then let's set them in motion together. For example, by putting them on a train or a rocket ship. Or if you're lazy and you don't want to put them on a rocket ship, let's just wait 12 hours because the Earth is rotating, and so if at one time they're going 460 meters per second to the left, 12 hours later they're going to be going 460 meters per second to the right. Or you could wait six months if you're very patient, and then they'll, move, they'll, they'll be moving at a relative velocity of 60 kilometers per second relative to how they were. And then we can ask whether they remain synchronized. And the answer, uh, thankfully, is yes they remain synchronized. And indeed, it is an experimental fact that they remain synchronized for all types of clocks. And when we come back to consider the consequences of special relativity, we will use this principle of relativity about the synchronization of clocks to draw uh, some rather uh, interesting conclusions. So this is Galilean relativity. Um, it is one of the most important basic principles in physics. And unfortunately, uh, Galilean relativity, at least as formulated by Newton and Galileo and all of the physicists up until the late 19th century, uh, is incorrect. And in fact, there is also evidence 
against Galilean relativity. I'll put against in quotes. So it's really against Galilean relativity, but as Einstein discovered, there is a version of relativity which is consistent with this new observation. And the primary evidence against Galilean relativity comes from Maxwell's equation. So I will just remind you of Maxwell's equation, although the details won't be terribly important for what I'm going to discuss uh, in this class. So Maxwell's equation is a set of equations that tell us how electric and magnetic fields evolve in time. So uh, I'm just going to write down two of Maxwell's equations, although, of course, there are four Maxwell equations. So here, E and B are the vectors that denote the electric and magnetic field. And I've written down the two Maxwell equations that tell us how these fields vary in time. So their time derivatives on the left-hand side are determined in terms of the spatial derivatives of the electric and magnetic fields on the right-hand side of these equations. And I've written down a particularly simple version of the Maxwell equations where the charge density and the current are zero. And as you may or may not remember from your freshman physics classes, there are some more complicated equations that would take into account the presence of electric charge and current. Uh, is this terrifying to you when I write down Maxwell equations like this? Is this reasonably familiar to you? I'm not going to dwell. This is not a class on the pro detailed properties of Maxwell's equations, although that's a lot of fun. I just want to appeal to some basic facts here. I mean, I'm assuming here that everyone has seen Maxwell's equations in this form. You may have seen them in an integral form rather than a dif differential form. How many people have not seen them in this particular form? Okay. okay. Um, if you haven't seen them in this particular form, don't worry, you will soon in one of your other classes. Um, this is not a class on electromagnetism. Um, although I think I would encourage you, for example, to take a look at the first chapter of our textbook, Bernstein, which has a review of uh, a few features of this, just so that we're all on the same footing. Uh, but the basic uh, observation that I would like to make about Maxwell's equation is that you can take the time derivative of the first equation and plug it into the second equation to obtain an equation just for the electric field. Which says that the second time derivative of the electric field is proportional to the second spatial derivative of the electric field where the right-hand side of this equation now involves a curl of a curl, which you presumably know a bit about from your vector calculus classes, but it's basically a fancy uh, form of second derivative. And whenever you see an equation of this form where the second time derivative of something is proportional to the second spatial deriv derivative of something, that should set up alarm bells in your head because this is a wave equation. And the solutions of this equation describe propagating waves. So this is a wave equation. Very similar, for, the, for example, to the equation that would describe water waves as they propagate across the surface of a pond, or the equation that would describe the waves on a guitar string that will propagate when you pluck the guitar string. And there's one important parameter that appears here, which is defined in terms of those basic parameters mu naught and epsilon naught that appeared in Maxwell's equations. And um, just as an exercise, I would like you to all pause and sit for a minute and calculate the dimensions of this quantity mu naught times epsilon naught. Or you don't have to calculate it if it's obvious to you. <laughs> 
Stare at that equation, and from this equation, you should be able to determine what the dimensions of mu naught and times epsilon naught are. Okay, let's go through it together. E has some dimensions, but I don't care about that, because both sides of this equation are linear in E. I only have to care about the uh, uh, dimensions of those derivatives that are appearing everywhere. So E has some dim So let's look at the left-hand side of this equation. E has some dimensions. So d by dt of e has dimensions of e over time. And the second time derivative of e has dimensions of e over two powers of time. Likewise, on the right-hand side of that equation, I have two spatial derivatives. So the left-hand side of this equation has dimensions of e over time squared, whatever e's dimensions are. And the right-hand side of this equation has dimensions of E over length squared, because I have two spatial derivatives, times whatever the dimensions of uh, 1 over mu naught epsilon naught are. That tells you that mu naught times epsilon naught has dimensions that are determined in terms of length and time. And in fact, if you think about it, they have dimensions of 1 over velocity squared. So that means that the waves, which are solutions of this equation, will propagate with some characteristic velocity which is determined by that dimensionful parameter mu naught times epsilon naught. And in particular, uh, you can check mu naught times epsilon naught has, has units of 1 over velocity squared. So the speed at which these waves will propagate is uh, 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. Now, by dimensional analysis, one could only compute that it would be something order 1 times that. But in fact, if you go through and look at the wave solutions to Maxwell's equation, you'll find that they propagate at exactly the speed 1 over mu naught times epsilon naught. And one of the most remarkable consequences of Maxwell's equation, one of the most remarkable discoveries of 19th century physics, was that if you look at Maxwell's equations and you calculate the values of epsilon naught and mu naught by studying uh, magnetic fields and electric fields and how they respond to one another, then the speed that comes out from this wave equation is precisely the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. OK, it's not precisely the speed of light. Precisely the speed of light is 2 point something, something, something times the speed, times uh, 10 to the 8 meters per second. But uh, in this class, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second until, uh, until announced otherwise. So, the important consequence, however, of Maxwell's equations is that this speed came out of the equations of motion without reference to any particular observer. So, one consequence of Maxwell's equations is that the speed of light is fixed, and in particular, it is independent of the reference frame that one uses to measure it, or to say, to say another way, it is independent of the observer who is measuring the speed of light. In Maxwell's equations, I never told you uh, that um, you know we were measuring the electric field and magnetic field with respect to my frame of reference here on the Earth, or another frame of reference that's moving. Uh, at a relative velocity of 30 kilometers per second or 30 meters per second or whatever. I never told you whether I was on a train or not. So this uh, was one of the great uh, mysteries, I think, of 19th century physics. The apparent contradiction between Maxwell's equations, which predict a speed of light that is observer independent, with the principle of Galilean relativity. Remember, in Galilean relativity, uh, I could be standing still um, 
with respect to me, but from your point of view, I could be moving at 20 meters per second if I'm standing in a train or something like that. And so according to the standard Galilean principle of relativity, if I were to shine a flashlight to the left, then I would see that that flashlight is moving at one particular velocity. But you, looking at me on the train with the flashlight, would see that the light was traveling at a different velocity. So there's a basic uh, contradiction between relativity as formulated by Galileo and Newton and Maxwell's equations, which imply that the speed of light is uh, different uh, in all reference frames. Is the same, sorry, what did I say? The same in all reference frames. Now, um, I should say, just as a bit of historical aside, um, to a lot of 19th century and early 20th century physicists, uh, Galilean relativity uh, was much more important to them than uh, Maxwell's equations. And so many 19th and early 20th century physicists postulated that there was, in fact, uh, well, that... Actually, let me restate that. Many 19th and 20th century physicists postulated that, in fact, light was propagating through some medium, okay, just like water waves were, pop were um, propagating through some medium, and that uh, this medium was called the ether, and that this would provide a rest frame in which Maxwell's equations were absolutely correct, and that one should then consider uh, the principles of Galilean relativity as applied to the ether. And so that was one uh, possible resolution of this paradox. One possible resolution could be that Maxwell's equations uh, were wrong, that one should formulate them with reference to some ether. But um, it turns out that uh, the answer, this was not correct. Okay, It was a good guess, but it wasn't correct. And that the correct answer is that the principle of Galilean relativity is wrong. And so um, that so it was really Einstein who first took seriously the implications of Maxwell's equation for uh, um, rel for uh, relativity, and who asked the question, uh, "Can I have my cake?" By which I mean. Relativity, and eat it too. By which I mean Maxwell's equations. And the answer is yes, but only if we modify the formulation of relativity in Newtonian physics. Uh, and accommodate some seemingly uh, uh, contradictory or at least uh, quite confusing um, implications. And this, of course, is the theory of special relativity. So before diving into any uh, real details of uh, the mathematics of special relativity, I would just like to go through a few very simple examples which uh, hopefully you've seen before, um, that will introduce some of the basic uh, implications of these two, uh, of this, these two postulates. The correctness of the principle of relativity and that of Maxwell's equations. So let me consider the following very simple example. So I formulated the principle of relativity in terms of clocks. Okay. I said that one way of thinking about Galilean relativity is to think about the synchronization of two clocks that are moving perhaps at some relative velocity. So let's imagine the simplest possible clock that I could construct. Well, it's not the simplest from an experimental point of view. Experimentally, it's a very complicated clock. But in terms of the concepts that we're dealing with today, it's a very simple sort of clock. So. I would like to construct a clock as follows. I would like to take two mirrors and I would like to measure time intervals by looking at how many times light bounces between these two mirrors. 
So, for example, I could define one tick of the clock to be the amount of time it takes light to go from one mirror to the other and then bounce back. Okay. So this is a light bouncing between two mirrors. So one tick of the clock equals the light transit time. Or I guess I should really say twice the light, light transit time if I want to measure a tick of the clock by how long it takes the light to get from one mirror to the other, bounce back to get to the first again. And so if I denote by L the distance between the two, so let me say that. So if L is the distance between the two mirrors, then there will be one tick, the length of one tick will be twice L divided by the speed of light. So this is all well and good. So let me build not just one of these clocks, but let's build two. And let's set one in motion. with respect to the other. So let's say that I'm standing right here with my clock. Okay, there's my clock. The light is bouncing back and forth. And then let's take another clock, which is moving at some velocity with respect to the first clock. So I would now like to ask, how long it takes this clock to tick as measured by an observer for whom the first clock is at rest. So let's try and analyze this in, in uh, a bit more detail. So let's say that the first mirror emits a, these two clocks are synchronized. And so uh, the lower mirror will emit a beam of light at some time T1. But then the second clock is moving with some velocity v. And so it will hit the second mirror at some later time t2, at which point the mirror has moved some distance to the right. And then it will bounce back and hit the lower mirror at some later time t3. And I'd like to calculate how long it takes that process to happen. Is the setup clear to everyone? Any questions? So here V is the relative velocity of the two clocks. <coughs> okay. Given the fact that the speed of light is always constant, this is now easy to do. So um, let's first uh, compute the difference between T1 and T2. So T1, here, let me give myself a little more room. So T1, the difference between T1 and T2, well, so let's denote by L here, again, the distance between the two mirrors. And let's denote by D the distance that the uh, clock will travel between the time the light is emitted from one mirror and is received at the other mirror. Then T1 minus T2 is equal to the distance the light travels, which is L squared, the square root of L squared plus D squared by the Pythagorean theorem divided by the speed of light. Okay. And the distance that the clock travels is, of course, just the velocity of the clock times T2 minus T1. Okay. 
So these two equations say, first, that the uh, light, light is traveling at the speed of light, c. And the second equation is just saying that the distance is the velocity of the clock times the amount of time elapsed between the emission of the light from the lower mirror and its receipt at the upper mirror. So let's go ahead and solve that equation. So we could square both sides of this lower equation. T2 minus T1 squared is 1 over C squared, L squared, plus D squared. And D squared is given by that second equation. So that's V squared times T2 minus T1 squared. So let's go ahead and solve that for T2 minus T1. So you move the T2 minus T1 onto the other side and you get T2 minus T1 squared is equal to L squared over C squared times 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared. Sorry, uh, 1 over the square root. Sorry, 1 over 1 minus V squared over C squared. So what have I done there? I've moved the T1 minus T2 squared onto the left-hand side of that equation, and I've divided both sides of the equation by 1 minus V squared over C squared. Or taking the square root of both sides, T2 minus T1 is L over C times 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. And what is that? That is the amount of time it takes uh, for one half of a tick of the clock. And let's compare that. So this is a tick of the moving clock. And let's compare that to the amount of time it took our original clock to tick. So one half of a tick of the original clock was just L over C. So what does this mean? This means that the tick of the original clock, let's call it tick two, is related to the amount of time it takes the original clock to tick, the one that's not moving, by a factor of the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. And this is time dilation. And I want you to remember that I started out this discussion by saying that one of the consequences of relativity is that any two kinds of clocks have to remain synchronized. So I could build one clock out of mirrors and light rays, and I could build another clock uh, out of uh, a, a piece of quartz that I use in my pocket watch, or I could build a clock out of uh, uh, water that's dripping through an hourglass, or I could build a clock out of uh, a pendulum which is swinging in a grandfather clock, or I could build a clock out of someone's heart who is, which is beating at some very uh, constant uh, rate, like maybe Lance Armstrong. Um, um, and all of those clocks should remain synchronized. Okay. And this is the basic principle of time dilation. So let me just state it again. Which is that a pair of events which are separated by a time interval, let's call it T1 in their rest frame, namely the frame where those events are at rest, will appear to be separated by a time interval Uh, T2, which is greater than T1, and so I'll call that time T2 gamma times T1, which is greater than T1, 
in a frame, uh, or let's say to an observer, or in a frame which is moving, with relative velocity, v. And here I've defined the factor gamma to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And it's going to be real and larger than 1 when the velocity is less than the speed of light. If you consider velocities that are greater than the speed of light, uh, this expression for gamma begins looking uh, rather funny. Um, but fortunately, as we'll discover later in this class, uh, that's not something that we have to worry about. Um, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. And let me pause also to plug in my laptop. Are there any questions? Yes. So is the, the annihilation of time on the ground for the traveling faster than the speed of light? Like it stays at the speed of light, but then it takes more time to propagate? Something just happened. Um, yeah. Um, is, this, is it a workaround? I mean, um, it's just a con. At this point, I think I want to view time dilation as a consequence of the two basic postulates, namely that all motion is relative and there is no such thing as an absolute velocity, and that the speed of light is constant in all reference frames. The speed of light is constant to all observers. So I would say that the fact that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light is a consequence of those two um, facts. Um, and whether, and of course, time dilation is related to this effect, um, but I wouldn't say that it's a consequence of that. Is it like an Absolutely, yes. yes. Absolute. So, for example, the way that this would work in Newtonian in Newtonian physics, of course, the t clocks would tick at the same rate. And why would they tick at the same rate? Well, it's because the velocity of the light, or whatever it is you're using to define the clock, would change depending on whatever reference frame you're in. And so, uh, it's really, I mean, Einstein uh, is a brilliant guy because he really took absolutely seriously Maxwell's equation and their statement that the speed of light is a universal constant independent of the choice of frame that one uses to measure it. So uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we'll have a lot more time for questions uh, and even some answers uh, next class. Please don't.